So thank you very much. It's a joy for me to be here, not only to be part of this, this terrific um, symposium, but also because I, I spent a year as a house officer at a uh, hospital that used to be called the Peter Brent Brigham Hospital. I don't know whatever happened to it. And I also spent three years as a house officer, a hospital that was crushed by this building. Used to be on this site, but then this building landed on top of it and pulverized it completely. It's very nice to be back. As you heard, I'm gonna talk a little bit about a very strange topic, which was how risk for certain de neurodevelopmental disorders, I'll focus primarily on schizophrenia, but this is not really only about schizophrenia. I have something to do with how genes are regulated in the human placenta. And I can't resist starting by just asking the question, how did it come to this? I mean, how did I, who basically was trained as a neuroscientist studying behavior disorders, get into the uterus? So um, the answer to this is basically that I've been interested for basically my whole career at trying to understand how certain inborn features of human behavior might also be relevant to the emergence of major psychiatric disorders, even those disorders that might first be diagnosed or manifest themselves in early adult life. So there have been many ways over the 30 plus years that I've been pursuing this question that we've tried to answer it. But I want to illustrate one strategy, one example of, of a number of strategies using the same technology, which is looking at how genes are processed and expressed in the human brain across the human lifespan. And the, with the first approach we've taken was the simple question, if you believe that genes associated with developmental behavior disorders have something to do with how a brain is built from very early in life, it's not that far-fetched to imagine that those genes have to be abundantly expressed during fetal life. So we generated a simple hypothesis that if genes, these, the developmental origins of certain psychiatric disorders have something to do with gene regulation, we would expect these genes possibly to be even more abundantly expressed during fetal life than postnatal life. We've looked at this in a number of ways. And what we do in general is we take a list of genes that have been linked for association with developmental behavior disorders. This can come from the current most in fashion approach called the GWAS study. It can come from sequencing um, protein coding regions of the genome called exome sequencing studies. It can come from looking for chromosomal aberrations and looking for genes that are found in those chromosomal aberrations. You come up with a list of genes. And then you look in human brain across the lifespan starting in prenatal life at whether these sets of genes are more abundantly expressed during some period of life. And if you think that you're targeting development, you might expect them to be more developmental. So we've looked at these gene sets, and we've asked whether the composite gene sets associated with these orders are preferentially expressed during fetal life, particularly the disorders that we think are related to risk for developmental disorders, in contrast to genes that we think are related to risk for later life disorders particular neurodegenerative disorders. So the first study we did on this, we've done this now in several different studies, but this basically is the same message. We looked in human cortex from f across six different time periods, fetal life, early postnatal life, early adulthood, middle adulthood, mid-late life, and late life. We looked at all expressed features of the human transcriptome, not relying on prior annotation of the transcriptome and the genome, just looking at all expressed sequences. And what we did was we created a tool that we call Differential Expressed Region Finder, or DIR Finder, which, by the way, for any of you that use the UCSC website, you can download this custom tool, and anytime you look at a gene now on the UCSC website, you will see its expression across development and how it varies at different times of development. So we use this DIR finder to look for expressed features of the transcriptome that varied across these two, these six different uh, periods of life, and there was um, uh, six brains in each period. These are all normal brains. We identified um, with statistical correction a certain number of these differentially expressed regions across development. We then replicated it in another 36 regions. We looked at this in another human developmental brain sec in the mouse cortex across development, as well as in primary neuronal cultures that are from human pluripotent stem cells differentiated to different cortical neurons. All of these came up with a, with a a canonical group of 50,000 differentially expressed regions across development. Here's an example of a differentially expressed region across this exon of this gene. This is fetal life. 
This is immediately postnatally. This is childhood, late adulthood. This is clearly a gene or at least a feature of this gene that is expressed preferentially during fetal life. So then we ask the question, when we look at these gene sets, what do we find for some of these developmental other kinds of disorders? So for schizophrenia, it didn't really matter what the annotation was of this expressed region, whether you thought it was an exon or an intron or whatever it was. All of these were, different, were relatively more abundantly expressed during fetal life than postnatal life. The same thing was true with genes associated with intellectual disability, all autism, and very significant developmental disabilities in these syndromal neural developmental disorders. Some of these p-values are a little bit less because the gene sets themselves have many fewer genes in them than the schizophrenia set. Interestingly enough, we saw nothing for type 2 diabetes, but Alzheimer's disease and Parkinson's disease also showed significantly differentially expressed transcriptome features across the lifespan. But here, the relatively more abundant expression was in late life, not in fetal life. So this sort of created a bipolar representation of certain genes related to developmental disorders that are more abundant in fetal life compared to later life. But of course, Gene expression, gene regulation, gene processing and development is very much related to the epigenetic state of the genome, which is a reflection of how environmental molecular influences program the genome to be related to, be, to regulate gene expression. So we did exactly the same study looking at the landscape of DNA methylation across these six developmental periods, and then we replicated it in another six brains. And this was this study. It was basically the same study, same brains, but now looking at DNA methylation. And we showed basically there is no gene in the human genome of brain that does not change its epigenetic state from being a fetus to being immediately postnatal. This is clearly the most dramatic environmental experience of a human being with respect to how it programs the epigenetic state of the genome. No longer being a fetus is a big change in the environment. Um, and we, we identified a number of so-called differentially methylated regions across the genome. And then we asked the same question. If we look at these regions of the genome that change their epigenetic state across development, meaning they are reflecting at the level of, of, of uh, uh, genetic plasticity, what, how do the gene sets related to these developmental disorders map on these developmentally regulated um, uh, 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 regions? And we found um, that there are many more of these so-called methylated cytosine dinucleotides uh, in, um, uh, in, in the regions of the genome that have been associated with schizophrenia related to prenatal life than to rated later in life. Uh, these were specific for schizophrenia. We didn't find these in Alzheimer's disease or Parkinson's disease. And that we also had the opportunity to look at the brains of people around the time that this diagnosis is made in early adult life between age 18 and 25, a tumultuous time of life, a time when there's a great deal of environmental things happening. Those regions of the transcript of the genome that change their epigenetic state during early adult life were not enriched for those regions of the genome that have been associated with genetic risk for schizophrenia. There was no enrichment for those areas. Um, these, these results suggested that risk factors for schizophrenia, both genetic and those environmental factors that leave a mark in the adult brain, are principally related to early brain development and not to the tumultuous time of clinical diagnosis. It's important to realize that it's not to suggest that what happens when you're 18 to 25 is not having an effect on how your genome regulates the expression of genes in your brain. It's just that the only common signal in all these adult brains uh, that we found in patients with schizophrenia had something to do with early fetal life and not something to do that we could see that was common to them as a group. This has been shown now in many, many studies. So there have been studies looking at uh, 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 single nucleotide mutations in coding regions of the genome, showing that they implicate a number of fetally relevant um, uh, uh, features of brain development. People have looked at uh, so-called uh, uh, DNA methylation and how they relate to early fetal life. Chromosomal uh, conformation, which is uh, long distance regulation of gene expression based on three dimensional figure uh, figurations of, of uh, chromatin, also suggest effects during oral fetal life. And uh, we actually published last year a much larger study of this, basically showing the same thing.
So it's very clear that there's a biology of early brain development that has something to do with, uh, the, uh, with a sort of background risk for emergence of schizophrenia later in life. But this environmental component that we see in the changing uh, DNA methylation landscape is the elephant in the room. And the challenge, I think, in all of common human illnesses is how do the genes and environment interact with each other? So there are three things we know about schizophrenia. And I learned these when I was working in the hospital that was crushed by this building. The first is that these are not, these are not disorders that are caused by a gene. There's no gene for mental illness, no gene for heart disease, there's no gene for stroke. These are all polygenic conditions where many risk factors exist probably in different combinations, interact in different ways in individuals to explain their individual risk. We knew this before we did a GWAS study. We've also known for a long time that the early environment matters. There have been many examples of epidemiological studies looking at risk to uh, pregnant women related to influenza or nutrition or uh, various stresses suggesting that there's an increased risk in offspring developing schizophrenia. But we also knew this from very interesting studies that are generally ignored in the literature. And that is that if you look at um, dizygotic twins and what the relative risk within a twin pair who are dizygotic, meaning they don't have the exact same genome, there's about a 15 to 20% probability that if one twin is ill, the other twin is ill. Dizygotic twins are genetically the same as a pair, as are siblings from unrelated pregnancies. They each share, on average, 50% of their alleles. But if you look at the, at the relative risk of sib pairs, that if you have a sibling that has schizophrenia, what is your risk? It's 5 to 10%. It's about half the risk of your dizygotic twins. There's no greater dissimilarity of genetic sharing in siblings from unrelated pregnancies and in dizygotic twins. But dizygotic twins share a uterus, which siblings of unrelated pregnancies do not. And the last thing we know, which Tracy mentioned, is that all developmental behavior disorders, whether it be schizophrenia, autism, ADHD, dyslexia, Tourette syndrome, uh, they all are two to four times more common in males and females. This cannot be about differences in autosomal allele frequencies. Obviously, you get half your genes from your mother, half your genes from your father. Males and females have the same frequency of autosomal uh, 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 allele genes. So, and actually, a very interesting study, which just appeared this month in the American Journal of Psychiatry, and Jill Goldstein's in the audience, was part of this study, as our other collaborators here at Harvard, looked at uh, risk for mothers with a bacterial infection and offspring developing schizophrenia. And basically what they showed was that the risk scaled with the severity of the bacterial infection. This is from the New England Family Study. And it was greater in males than females. But there was a significant risk factor for schizophrenia emerging from these pregnancies. There are many studies that have analogous uh, results, many of which actually Jill did. So the question we asked was, how does genetic risk relate to this complication of pregnancy that seems to be a risk factor? Do genetic and environmental risk factors act independently, or do they interact to modulate each other's contribution to risk? So actually, I've been interested, it's also for a long time, this is a study we published over 10 years ago, where we looked at a number of genes that had been implicated in hypoxic ischemic cell injury, and whether or not they were inherited as a risk factor disproportionately in offspring. This was a family study where there was a complicated pregnancy. And we found a number of these showed much greater odds ratios of implications for risk if there was a complicated pregnancy in the offspring in versus not complicated pregnancy. And one of the shockers, which we didn't appreciate at the time, because this SNP, which was a previously unregistered SNP, uh, in BDNF had a dramatic increase in risk valence in these family samples if the offspring had a complicated pregnancy or didn't. This SNP, as it turned out, subsequently when it was uh, identified, is in the promoter of the, uh, of the uh, BDNF uh, promoter that's expressed in the placenta. But the problem with all these studies is risk for any common illness is not about one off common variant or another. It's about your genome. And in essence, you are you know, the product of your genome, your resilience, your risk is the product of this genome. 
So the question then became, is there a way that we can look at the relationship between complicated pregnancies and overall genomic risk? And one of the strategies that's been used has been to develop this cumulative additive sum of all the associated risk alleles in a large population-based study. This was the first big GWAS study of schizophrenia <clears throat> with over 100,000 subjects. And what you can, this is the classic Manhattan plot. You've seen a million of these things. Every one of these peaks is a, uh, a tall buildings is supposed to be a region of the genome where a significant difference in allele frequencies between patients of schizo with schizophrenia and, and controls for this variant, and this is the statistical significance correction high bar that any of these loci have to achieve to be cor significant corrected for all these different conceivable millions of sites of the genome that might be scored. And so you can add up all the alleles here in any given individual that are the same alleles that were the risk-associated allele in this big GWAS study. You add them all up, and let's say there are 100, so you could have a score anywhere from 0 to 100. Patients with schizophrenia tend to have higher scores because they are more like these samples that were at risk than, than non-patients. But you can also, and so the, the score based on what is the, all the significant loci is called the polygene risk score one. But you can also go down in significance. And the polygene risk score one is made up of a little over 100 SNPs. But you can say, well, let's, let's go down to 10 to the minus 6, not 10 to the minus 8, because many of these will turn out to be significant risk genes when these sample sizes get bigger. We have more power. And when you do that, you get about 238 genes. And you can keep going down just to accumulate bigger scores. So now we have a measure of overall genomic risk that we can use to ask how does this relate to whether a, 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 a pregnancy is complicated or not. Again, complicated pregnancies have been identified in many studies as risk factors for many behavior disorders. ADHD, schizophrenia, it's a two to four-fold increase in risk. Autism, many, many studies. It's actually a study Tom Hyde and I published a number of years ago looking at twins with Tourette syndrome that were all 10 years of age and uh, they both had, to, they were monozygotic twins, they both had Tourette syndrome, uh, but they didn't have the exact same severity of ticks. Some had much worse ticks than others, and what we showed in this study was that the difference of tick severity within genetically identical monozygotic twins was strongly predicted by differences in APGAR score at birth. We use a scale to, to grade in uh, information we have about pregnancy complications. It's a scale that's been applied in many studies called the mcneil showstrom scale, which is a way of rating the severity of a complication and its potential implications for physiological uh, uh, um, stress to the fetus. And you can see some of these obviously represent significant stresses. Many of these likely represent minor stresses, but there's a way of scoring them. So this is what we did. We took a sample of patients with schizophrenia controls, 500 subjects, and we measured their polygene risk scores. And we showed, as everybody has shown now that looked at this, if you take a group of patients with schizophrenia, you measure their polygene risk scores at the, at the highest level of significance, what we call the PRS1. This is adding up all the alleles in every individual's genome that are the same ones that were risk associated in that big GWAS study where there were 100 such loci. Patients have much higher polygene risk score than do the controls. But now we said, well, what if we partition these patients based on whether they had a complicated pregnancy or not? Let's rerun the analysis, exact same analysis, but now we're going to separate patients with a complicated pregnancy and without. And when we did that, what we found, which should have surprised us, the only group where there was a significant difference in polygene risk scores was the group that had a complicated pregnancy. And that, in fact, the group didn't have a complicated pregnancy. There was no difference in polygene risk score. These are relatively small groups, so this lack of a difference could all be an, a, a, a power issue. The other thing we found, which we found in many other groups now, is that if you had a, a significant obstetric complication and you didn't find your way into the bin that we call schizophrenia, your polygene risk score for schizophrenia was actually down. Because if you had both risk factors, there would be an increased probability that you wouldn't be in the normal bin. And that's what makes this interaction significant. It's not only the patients are up in the context of an early life complication, but the controls are down. We replicated this in the only two data sets that were part of the Psychiatric Genetics Consortium, where they had detailed obstetric complication histories 
and um, uh, polygen risk scores. And we found this in two other samples. Um, let me show you what this accounts for, because the result here, this is actually the, the meta-analysis of, analysis of all the subjects, a very strong interaction here, 10 to the minus 6. Um, the two findings that emerge from this study, the first is, we can see here, we only see an interaction of polygene risk score, which is genomic risk for schizophrenia, and a history of a, severe, of a serious obstetric complication in the first two levels of polygene risk score calculation. That is the PRS1 and PRS2. When we go down to other levels of significance in the GWAS studies, where we're going to 10 to the minus 4, 10 to the minus 2, 10 to the minus 1, well, there's no interaction between polygene risk scores and schizophrenia. It's only at the highest levels of significance. The difference in whether you had an interaction, whether you had an obstetric complication and a polygene risk score on risk, this is a measure of predicting liability, is fivefold. If you had no obstetric complication, which is the red bar here, your risk was a little less than 2%. If you had it, your risk was over 10%. So this is a true non-additive leap in, uh, in risk for schizophrenia based on the addition of these two things. And this is just to show how much this matters. But again, nothing when you go lower on what the GWAS significant loci were. And the assumption, of course, is that this is all about power. When we have millions of people genotyped, all of these will probably have significance at the 10 to the minus 8. But, and it's assumed that most of the genes here, uh, most of what's in these loci are schizophrenia genes. Why are these two the only regions that uh, show significance? I want to mention my two postdocs at the time who did this work, Gianluca Orsini and Giovanna Punzi. This is to again show a meta-analysis now only of the patients. We actually replicated this in a Japanese sample and another sample. We didn't have obstetric complications. If you had an ELC, your polygene risk score is higher. This is now five samples. And again, this is only found in the most significant polygene risk score thresholds. Despite the, all the genes that might be down here that are schizophrenia-associated, risk-associated, they don't show any interaction. What is it about these genes? Um, how important is the severity of ELC? If these ELCs modulate the impact of genomic risk and vice versa, it would be expected that this interaction would scale with the severity of the early life complication. And that's exactly what the data show. So these are the values of the um, obstetric complication where there is very little physiological risk to the fetus. There's no difference in polygen risk scores here. As the severity gets bigger, the sample sizes get smaller, this is where the interaction occurs. And when you get to what is essentially preeclampsia and eclampsia, there's almost no overlap between the effect of polygen risk score and obstetric complication here. So, how do these guys interact? And so the question really is, what is happening in these loci that have genes that are significant at the 0.08, 10 to the minus 8 and 10 to the minus 6 levels? We hypothesized that the reason those were the GWAS significant loci is not necessarily because those genes matter more to schizophrenia, but those loci may contain genes that interact with a common environmental event which is a complicated pregnancy. It happens in about 15 to 20% of pregnancies. And that interaction gives those loci the statistical heft to get over this critical high bar of 10 to the minus 8 and 10 to the minus 6, at six significance. So this led to what's going on at the placenta. So we've looked at the placenta in a number of ways. This was all from this paper of a year ago, a year and a half ago. The first thing we did was we looked in the placenta samples from Roadmap Epigenetics Program, and we analyzed all the RNA-seq data in those placentae. And what we did was we looked at whether or not the genes in the PRS 1 and 2 risk loci, the ones that interact with obstetric complication, increase risk, whether they are relatively more abundantly expressed than the schizophrenia genes in all the other polygene risk score loci that don't interact with obstetric complications. So the reference here are the genes in the other loci that don't show this clinical interaction. The genes in the loci in a number of different regions of the, of the, uh, of the placentae, and these are the number of placentae that were analyzed, are all much more abundantly expressed. What happens 
in a, ple in a placenta from a complicated pregnancy. So we looked, we had eight data sets from complicated pregnancies, preeclampsia, intrauterine growth restriction. We also even had some trophoblasts that were taken ex vivo out of uh, placental biopsies. And we looked at the same question. The genes in the polygene risk score one and two loci, were they differentially regulated in placenta from complicated pregnancies compared to all the other schizophrenia genes in the other loci? And this is what the data look like across these eight different data sets. Every one of them show that the distribution of the genes in the polygene risk score one and two are differentially regulated in placentas from complicated pregnancies compared to the schizophrenia genes in the other loci from the GWAS studies that don't interact with obstetric complications. All of this suggests that the placenta gene regulation story is responsible for the obstetric complication interaction with risk. So we could ask this question very specifically by partitioning those genes uh, in, the, in the polygene risk score loci that are placental mediated and non-placental mediated. We fractionate these polygene risk scores into what we call placental polygene risk scores and non-placental polygene risk scores. What we have now is a set of loci that contain genes dynamically regulated in placentas from complicated pregnancies. We have a set of schizophrenia-associated loci that are not regulated in placenta from complicated pregnancies. And what you see here is, this is looking at the plaque polygene risk score one and two, that this is where the interaction is. So again, no ELC, no difference between polygene risk scores, early life complication, a clear difference in poly risk scores. Here are the non-plaque polygene risk scores. These are the same loci in the same PRS1 and the same PRS2, but they don't have genes within those loci differentially modulated in placentas of complicated pregnancy. There is no interaction here at all. These are not the genes that explain this interaction are specifically schizophrenia genes that matter to a stressed placenta. When you do a variety of different pathway analyses to see what's different about the plaque polygene risk score low side genes and the non-plaque polygene risk score, they are completely orthogonal biology. The non-plaque polygene risk score genes, which have something to do with the brain, presumably, are all about calcium signaling, synapses, uh, um, uh, fragile X, many of the things that have been previously identified. Uh, the, um, the, the genes that are about the placental contribution to planisian risk are about protein folding, oxidative stress, response to hypoxia, many of the things you might imagine placenta cells marry about, care about. How does the plaque polygene risk scores influence placentation? What do these risk genes in schizophrenia dynamically regulated complicated pregnancies doing in the placenta. So animal studies, many of which come from Tracy, suggest that many placental stresses, regardless of what they are, initiate an immune response in the placenta. So we have all this RNA sequencing data from placentas of complicated pregnancies. We can say, how do they, how did the expression of the schizophrenia polygene risk scores in the placenta relate to the immune response of the placenta? And this is just to show that in a gene set of 550 immune response and inflammatory genes, there is very strong co-expression of the placental genes related to risk for schizophrenia. And what you see here is these are the, the non-plaque genes are in this purple color. Um, that, that is the genes in the same PRS1 and 2 schizophrenia loci that are not regulated in the placenta of complicated pregnancies. Those show absolutely no difference from the entire set of genes expressed uh, in the placenta, but the ones that are in the plaque polygene risk score ones, that is the same set of genes that are expressed in this, from the schizophrenia loci in complicated pregnancies, they are dramatically co-expressed with the set of immune genes. And these are not immune genes. So there were a few immune genes. We took them out of this analysis. These genes are not the immune genes. They are monitoring the immune response stress uh, of, the, of the, the immune response, presumably a stress-mediating response of the placenta. Okay, last but not least, I mentioned this thing about higher incidence in males, and we were also interested in this question. And so we you know from animal studies, again, Tracy has been really the the pioneer in this work, is suggesting that um, the outcomes of alter placental function on brain development are relatively spe sex-specific. 
with males more vulnerable than females to prenatal adversities? Is there a link with a greater incidence of developmental disorders like schizophrenia in males? And basically, here's the same story. We're now looking in the placentas from complicated pregnancies, whether the expression of this set of genes that we call the plaque polygene risk score locus genes one and two are differentially expressed in the male uh, um, placenta from female placenta, and these are dramatically differentially expressed. In This is the distribution, the, the T distribution of all the values across this set of genes, and they are dramatically more expressed in males than in females. Now, everything I've shown you thus far is a way to identify loci in the genome, and presumably genes within those loci, that have something to do with mediating this interaction between genetic risk and um, uh, uh, obstetric complications for risk of schizophrenia. The, it's important to remember that GWAS, which is where we get our polygene risk scores from, is a strategy to, strategy to find association between genotype and a trait. It does not find genes. It's very important to keep that in mind, by the way. It's a very long leap from these GWAS loci p-values to genes. There are a few strategies that are popular now to try and link genetic variation, to associate genaria with potentially causal genes. One of the most popular ones uh, was developed by Alexander Gusev uh, here at Dana-Farber, which is called the Transcriptome-Wide Association Study, which is a strategy for imputing specific gene trait associations of GWAS SNPs based on the expression of genes related to those SNPs in irrelevant tissue. And the basic strategy for the, that's most popular for this transcriptome-wide association analysis is to have your um, clinical SNP associations with trait to weight them based on the degree to which G, uh, the same SNPs influence expression of genes in a tissue, and that you can use these weightings to infer genes that are associated with specific SNPs rather that explain the association with a trait. So we've done this. This is very new data. We've done this using the placenta from the Rhode Island Child Health Study, which is 147 placenta from term pregnancies. And we asked the question, if we do a TWAS study on these placenta, what can we identify that might be the actual explanatory genes for risk for schizophrenia using the weights from the expression of, from, uh, from EQTL associations in the placenta to the PGC uh, uh, data. And this is actually using the current, pre as of yet, unpublished data from a, a sample of patients with schizophrenia where there's about 240 uh, GWAS significant loci and about 800 genes. And basically, we can find 90 what we call TWAS significant genes. I'm going to show you in a minute that there's some segregation of males and females. These are the 10 genes, by the way, that presumably are putative risk genes for schizophrenia related to the placenta specifically that are shared by males and females. But what's really interesting is that there are clear differences between genes that are associated with GWAS significant variants and schizophrenia in the male placenta and the female placenta. I don't want to get into what these represent, but this is suggesting that really risk for schizophrenia that is mediated at least in part by the placenta shows sexual dimorphism in the specific genes that contribute to this level of risk. The last point I want to make is all of this, presumably, particularly because these are mostly studies of term placentas, might have some influence on child development. Does it matter? Are we, these children are not schizophrenic when they're six months of age or one month of age, but they do have this developmental molecular amlaga, which is the effect of genetic risk on the regulation and expression of genes in the, in the placenta. So we've had the opportunity to work with John Gilmore at University of North Carolina, who has an extraordinary study of 242 infants within the first week of life that they put in an MRI scanner. I don't know how they do that, but they do it. And um, we were able to ask the question, we have genomic scores on these infants. These are normal pregnancies for the most part. We could ask whether or not any of the MRI measures in these newborn infants relate to our placental polygene risk scores or the non-placental polygene risk scores. Are they, again, only about the polygene risk scores in the most significant loci, or are they about all of them? What about males and females? <laughs> 
So we've asked this question, and basically, here's the bottom line. It looks exactly like what we found from the placentas and from the risk for schizophrenia. There is a significant association, negative association. The higher the placental polygene risk score in these children, the smaller the total brain volume at birth, uh, and this is only for the two most significant regions. Again, absolutely no association for the non-plaque polygene risk scores, which presumably have some other role, and they may have a much bigger effect at age three and four and seven and eight. But in the first week of life, the readout of these placental effects is seen in brain size at birth and at cognitive function at one year of age. And these effects, this is actually looking at brain volume again. These effects are more significant in males than females. These are equally sized groups. This is not a power effect. It's not a big enough sample to see a, um, an interaction, although maybe it's moving in that direction. But clearly, the effect shows greater uh, effect size in males and females. And we see the same thing in cognitive development at one year of age. This is the Mullen proxy for an IQ score at one year of age. And again, this is much more significant in males than in females. There is no interaction with sex, but at least it looks like it has a greater effect this way. I don't want to suggest that this is a lasting imprint of the placental schizophrenia gene regulation story, but it has a readout very, very early in life. And what this translates into as the brain launches on a trajectory of development is a very interesting question. So mentioned a whole bunch of studies. These are the people whose work I show you. I always like to say when I give a talk like this that my principal job these days is email and PowerPoint. I have no idea why you get paid for things like that. But these are the people who've done this work. And these are groups from many different centers uh, around the world. So the take home message from these studies, I think, is fairly straightforward. The most significant genetic variants detected by current GWAS contribute to risk of schizophrenia, at least partly by converging on a developmental trajectory sensitive to intrauterine and perinatal adversity and linked with abnormal placentation. Gene environment interactions influencing plantal biology may account for the higher incidence of schizophrenia in males compared to females. Putative schizophrenia risk genes in placentae vary between the sexes. And genome scores based on schizophrenia risk associated genes dynamically regulated in placenta predict early brain and cognitive development. I think the real question here is whether this is an insight to a strategy for prevention. Preserving prenatal health may represent the primary form of prevention of schizophrenia, particularly in male individuals with high placental polygene risk scores. I like to say that, you know, in this era of genomic medicine, the treatment for a complicated pregnancy in most instances is bed rest. So there have to be more sophisticated strategies to reduce this stress that this placenta is experiencing. Thank you very much for including me. I look forward to your comments and questions. taken this, so, so that kudos. So I know we've had this discussion before, but I, I can't remember if there was a, what the answer was. Every time I see that data set, I think Josh has something similar for schizophrenia with the twins, monozygotic and dizygotic. But, right, but monozygotic twins are much more likely to share placenta than dizygotic. Has anybody ever taken the monozygotic twins and split them into those who shared and those who didn't and looked at Risk well, so that's a very important question. So there was a series of studies from, I, I cite these a lot because this is, you know, I, I'm looking at my friend David Rubin now. One of, the, one of the occupational hazards of having been trained in an earlier century is that, uh, you know, is that there, there's a lot of institutional memory. And there was a paper published by a guy named Bockledge. I mean, Jill may remember this in the in the uh, 70s, looking at monozygotic twins with schizophrenia. And his argument was that 85% of the time, when there were discordant twins, the twin, the second born lighter twin had schizophrenia. Uh, 
the assumption usually being that they have the smaller placenta. We actually, in the studies of John Gilmore, we have looked, he's got a sample of twins in there, about 60, 70 twins, and we've looked at the lighter twin, and the data are always stronger in the lighter twin of the monozygotic twins. We don't know if they share a placenta. Well, I mean, the assumption is most of them share placentas, but among, I think among MZ twins, about 75% are monochorionic and they share a placenta. The assumption is that they don't share it equally. And that, yeah, they don't share it equally. And I think, you know, it's an old saying, dizygotic twins are much healthier at birth than our monozygotic twins. And monozygotic twins usually have one, you know, runt of the litter, so to speak, that's a little bit smaller, usually second born. And the assumption is, and I think that's usually confirmed at birth, they have a small placenta. Comment on which complication? Okay, so the, this is an important question too because the problem in all these studies is you don't have enough complications of one type to be able to say this is the key complication. What we showed in the original paper was that if you just look at severity, and severity is based on the likely stress to the fetus, so clearly eclampsia is a major obstetrical uh, emergency. Preeclampsia is a significant obstetrical emergency. Um, uh, you know, um, uh, uh, labor, I mean, rupture of membranes with prolonged lack of labor is a major emergency. Fetal distress. So as those kinds of complications are scored, they have a much greater effect on the interaction with genomic risk than less severe complications. And in the data sets that we looked at with gene expression, most of those data sets were preeclamptic data sets. I think of the eight, probably five of them were preeclampsia. But we had the same thing in intrauterine growth restriction data sets. But that's clearly another data set where there's clearly a placental factor in, in fetal growth and development. Can you give me some examples of more acute? kind of stress. What about the chronic ones? Uh, I, I would imagine they would be more relevant for the brain development. So, you know, we don't have those data. I mean, the other problem with a lot of these studies, these are mostly term pregnancy studies. So we're doing a big collaboration with the Elgin study, at, again at UNC, where they have high-risk pregnancies and premature births. So we have those placentas. I mean, we're, we're trying to look at that in a different context. But, you know, these are, I mean, the remarkable thing here is, that these are term pregnancies, they're term placentas, they are generally healthy, you know, ch uh, infants, and these signatures still are observable. Um, sorry, just to expand on those questions that we're asking, can you comment on the, your underlying concept about the complications? Do are they? What are they causally related? Are they sort of an epiphenomenon, the acute versus chronic? So, I mean, I think Tracy probably has a better handle on this than I do. My assumption is, and I think this is what the bacterial data show, this is what the nutrition risk data for schizophrenia show, probably what the viral, to whatever extent that's robust data, risks show. My assumption is that the placenta is the critical intermediary in mediating these effects. One of the most popular <laughs> models uh, for early developmental deviation in animals is this, uh, this immune response, this maternal immune activation model, which most of those, um, those maternal immune active don't get into the fetus. They are changing the biology of the placenta. My colleagues in OBGYN, and I, you know, I knew very little about the placenta until about four years ago, and I now interact a lot with these colleagues, you know many of them, Marita Bird in particular, and they're always reminding me that the placenta is constantly under attack by the mother's immune system. These T cells are invading it constantly because the placenta is an alien tissue to the mother. It is a huge, it is a very rapidly growing, highly innovative alien tissue. And there is an immune response in the mother to reject it, which the placenta is constantly dealing with. Um, so, yeah. <laughs> 
comment. I was speaking with Dean Jones, uh, who looks at the relationship between eclampsia and postpartum psychosis and the risk of eclampsia. And one of the things that he said is that um, they have data showing that if uh, that the risk of eclampsia will go down in mothers during their subsequent pregnancies unless there is a different father. And then the risk is absolutely no, that's pain. So I wonder if the, if also if the, the, what the contribution of the, the father is to the, the subsequent development of risk. And so it's very interesting. We, we looked at this in this original paper. And we looked at, the, we, so we have genome scores from the parents. And we looked at whether or not the mother's genomic risk for schizophrenia or depression or other things had anything to do with them have, with, that, with the complicated pregnancy. There was zero relationship between the mother's, it was like 0.9. But the father's polygene risk score, there was a trend at like 0.1 for the father's polygene risk score to predict the complicated pregnancy. And I know you've talked about this. I mean, there's some data suggesting that paternal genes are differentially imprinted in placenta. It's a, yeah, I mean, it's a fascinating um, epistemological question that there's a revenge of the, of the father at this, you know, <laughs> during conception with respect to the uterus that's completely un, unexpected. It rears its ugly head, so to speak. Okay, great. Well, thank you again.